For 60 years, Citizens for Public Justice has been a powerful force for social change in Canada. Since 1963, we have advocated for policies that aim to eradicate poverty, care for creation, and support those who have been forced to flee their homes. Inspired by faith to act for justice, CPJ has made a real difference in the lives of countless individuals across the country. We partner with various organizations to raise awareness about the disproportionate impact of poverty on marginalized communities, call for progressive environmental policy solutions, and advocate for refugee and migrant rights. By coordinating interfaith calls to action against immigration detention and partnering with organizations like Human Rights Watch, we have successfully pressured Canadian provinces to end their immigration detention contracts. Through national coalitions, we amplify the voices of Indigenous people and youth to call for ambitious climate action and the preservation of Earth's diversity, sustainability and beauty. Our anti-poverty efforts also saw the release of Canada's first federal poverty reduction strategy and national housing strategy. As we look forward to the next chapter of our journey, we invite you to join us in our mission to build a more just, equitable, and sustainable society. Become a member of Citizens for Public Justice by making a donation today. Together, we will continue to make a difference for generations to come. To Citizens for Public Justice 60th anniversary. It is with great joy and deep gratitude that I stand here before you today as we gather to commemorate six decades of advocating for public justice and the common good. As the Executive Director of Citizens for Public Justice, I am humbled by the remarkable journey that we have undertaken together. Throughout the years, we have uh, been driven by a shared vision, a vision of a society rooted in compassion, fairness, and dignity for all. So this evening, we come together to honor the past, embrace the present, and ignite hope for the future. Now, I'm just coming up to four and a half years as the executive director, so probably know less about the history of CPJ than anyone else here. So I'm thrilled to have Harry Kitts here uh, who, uh, to, to join me in this, in this welcome. Harry served CPJ as executive director for 20 years. So that's a lot, lot longer than I've been around. So Harry, uh, extend your welcome as well. Thank you. Uh, yes, and welcome to this this celebration. I was looking at those pictures and some of them were kind of cringy, embarrassing about how young we looked in those days. Uh, but I think I'm now at the point where I can say there's a whole bunch of us old timers here, but it's really cool to see new folks joining on the board as staff, uh, as supporters and, and uh, joining in to continue the next 60 years. I first learned about CPJ when I was in high school, I think it was grade 10, <clears throat> when my teacher introduced us to the work that these characters like John Otheus were doing on the Mackenzie Valley pipeline uh, and how we needed to pay attention to indigenous issues and environmental issues and to think about whether or not such a pipeline was actually useful. And that was my sort of first introduction to CPJ. And then when I was 29, <clears throat> I was hired as executive director in theory to direct John Ultheus and Gerald Van de Zandy. <clears throat> yeah, soon John left to go to law school and Gerald had some health issues. And so I was kind of left on my own for a while, but uh, 20 years was a wonderful, wonderful time. There's a bunch of folks here who I hired. There were people on the, on the uh, pictures that were staff during my time 
um, and many of other folks that are here, I remember as supporters, your names are still familiar to me. So uh, welcome everybody and let's enjoy this evening. Before we proceed uh, any further with our celebration, it's very important to acknowledge the land on which we gather. We recognize that this event is taking place on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashinaabe, uh, the Chippewa, the Honda, Hondanasane, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We acknowledge the enduring presence, resilience, and wisdom of Indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land throughout generations. We honor their histories, their cultures, and their ongoing contributions to this community and the broader Canadian society. As we commemorate Citizens for Public Justice 60th anniversary, we are reminded of the importance of reconciliation and justice for Indigenous peoples. Last year, we took an important step in our organizational history by reiterating CPJ's repudiation of the doctrine of Christian discovery and our commitment to centering Indigenous reconciliation in our work through our equity and anti-oppression statement uh, that you can read at uh, cpj.ca. So may we all be inspired by the imperative of reconciliation as we gather here today, committing ourselves to building a more just and inclusive country where the rights and voices of Indigenous peoples are honored and respected. So tonight we are going to reflect on the efforts of countless individuals who have been part of this movement, whose commitment to justice has helped shape Canadian social justice work throughout the decades. We remember the advocates who have dedicated themselves to building a more equitable and inclusive Canada. Their courage and resilience continue to inspire us as we navigate the challenges of our time. In the face of adversity, we have remained steadfast in our mission amplifying voices that are often silenced and standing in solidarity with marginalized communities. We have sought to transform policies, challenge systems of oppression, and build bridges of understanding. And while our work is far from complete, we celebrate the milestones we have reached and the lives we have touched along the way. But there is still much more to be done. And that is why our theme tonight is intergenerational advocacy. It positions us to see how young adults formed CPJ 60 years ago and how the future of advocacy must continue to embrace the passion of all generations. And Harry, for me, and uh, certainly an important part of CPJ work is the annual presence of a public justice intern. This was one of the features that actually attracted me to CPJ uh, when, I, when I was uh, looking at it. And I understand that it was in your term as executive director that uh, this was initiated. So tell me more about that. Well, I guess it's been a theme uh, during my whole time within CPJ because I started young, was always to figure out how to engage young people. And so I would frequently speak at universities and high schools, uh, encouraged my, my staff to do the same, and hired young folks. I, can re I just saw Lorraine. I remember sitting in a, in a cafeteria in Edmonton, University of Alberta, talking to Lorraine about the potential of uh, working at CPJ. And so that was part of sort of what was happening. And folks then went on to do all kinds of fascinating things. In fact, one story before I get to that, your, your actual question. There was one moment when three of my staff came to me and said, we're considering law school, would you write a reference letter? So of course I write a reference letter. Two of them are in the room here, at least, I think I haven't seen the other. Uh, wrote the reference letter and three of them left to go to law school. So I lost a, a chunk of staff, but they've gone on to do wonderful things in refugee law, indigenous law, and, and other areas. So that's always been part of sort of the movement of folks. There've been others who've gone on to PhDs after spending a bunch of time 
uh, with CPJ. So those are, are parts of what I felt was always an important uh, angle to CPJ. And as you mentioned, John, you were very, very young when you started as well. Gerald was very young. And that became part of sort of the rotation of the generations of working through what we were doing. So when we were thinking about sort of what were the next sort of ways of doing this in a more formal way so that young people could be brought in, it, the idea came up of, uh, of this public justice intern position where somebody could spend a year, learn what we were doing, and then go on to do other kinds of things. And I think at least two of them, including one that's right here, were interns and eventually came onto the CPJ board. So that's another sort of way of them engaging into the, the work of CPJ, becoming champions and fans of CPJ uh, and continuing the work. Thank you. Well, tonight we are honored to be joined by all of you uh, here in person and online and our allies, our partners and our supporters. Your presence here and online signifies your belief in the power of collective action and your unwavering commitment to justice. So together we form a diverse tapestry of voices united by a common purpose to create a society where every person's inherent worth is recognized and where justice flows like a mighty river. As we embark on this evening celebration, let us embrace the spirit of gratitude and hope. I trust we will be inspired by the achievements of the past energized by the challenges of the present and motivated by the possibilities of the future. Together, we can shape a better tomorrow and that upholds the values of justice, compassion, and equity. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Gary. So tonight we're going to have three different panels and I'm quite excited about these conversation. Uh, our theme is seeking justice across generations, intergenerational advocacy for a just and sustainable society. So our first panel uh, and each of the panels will have sort of a, someone who can bring some historical perspective and then someone who will challenge us into uh, the way in which, or what does the way in which CPJ has made its impact in the past, how might that look in the future or now as well? So to start with, we're going to have John Oltus, and as I uh, introduce you, you can come on up and uh, have a seat. John Oltus was one of the founders of CPJ 60 years ago, and it is one of, uh, and is one of the founding partners of Oltus Clear uh, Townshend or OTK law firm. John has spent 40 years working with First Nations across Canada for recognition and implementation of their Aboriginal and treaty rights in his Aboriginal rights practice. John represents First Nations across Canada, his litigation matters and in major negotiations. This includes negotiating for comprehensive and specific land rights, self-government and impacts and benefits agreements with project proponents. John was legal counsel to Chiefs of Ontario and table negotiator at the Aboriginal government table for the Assembly of First Nations in the Charlottetown Accord constitutional negotiations. He has also appeared as counsel in environment cases and before various federal boards, commissions and agencies across Canada including the National Energy Board, the Berger Commission, and federal and provincial environmental assessment panels. And then we have uh, Eleanor uh, Rigaud is a Toronto-based climate justice activist. She is currently a program manager at Environmental Defense Canada, where she advocates for a just transition for workers and communities and for the cleanup of the tar sands toxic trailing ponds. She previously co-founded the youth-led group Fridays for Future Toronto and led numerous student climate strikes in that role while completing an economics and public policy degree for the University of Toronto. And these two will be moderated uh, by one of our board members and former um, 
um, former public justice intern, Kira Kang. So delighted to have all three of you here and please give them a round of applause. So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, today's panel discussion on intergenerational advocacy for a just and sustainable society. I'm your moderator, Kira, and I'm thrilled to have two esteemed uh, presenters here today on our first panel topic, which is on environment and climate. Uh, so please join me in welcoming John, a seasoned advocate uh, with a wealth of experience in Indigenous reconciliation and protection of Indigenous land rights. Um, and Ali, a passionate leader dedicated to mobilizing the next generation uh, towards climate justice. Um, I'll dive right into the question. Uh, so firstly, starting with John. Um, so reflecting on CPJ's 60-year uh, history, could you share um, specific uh, initiatives or campaigns um, where CPJ's advocacy work has led to a significant change in Canadian climate policy? And how does that historical achievement continue to impact or inspire CPJ's uh, work today? Should we switch here or can you see okay or should we actually? Uh, I was just saying, uh, should we sit here or uh, should we go up to the podium? Can... That's okay. Okay, well, I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be here. And I want to start by just uh, expressing my deep appreciation uh, to CPJ's supporters over 60 years and the, the staff and the board. It's a remarkable thing to have an organization that's uh, been around for 60 years, been making such a, a, a wonderful contribution, and uh, it's 60 years and counting. So uh, here's to you, CPJ. So in the early 70s, uh, uh, I was, and that's, uh, 1970, not 1870, <laughs> 1970. I was research uh, director at CPJ and we were just uh, getting started. And uh, I was reading a book such as uh, Schumacher's uh, Small is Beautiful. Do any of you resonate with that? Uh, Barry Commoner's uh, The Closing Circle and Poverty of, uh, uh, Poverty of Power and the Club of Rome talking about uh, exponential growth, uh, economic growth and how the carrying capacity of the earth. So I was very, very concerned and, and it's, it's interesting that those issues are still, and, and, and those approaches of those, those writers are still very, very uh, pertinent uh, today. And at the same time, there was the uh, seven sisters, the seven largest oil, uh, oil and gas companies in the world, Shell and Exxon and so on, who were proposing this uh, pipeline to take uh, natural gas from Prudhoe Bay in, uh, the, in Alaska, uh, through partly through the Yukon, then through uh, uh, Denenda, the homeland of the Dene, uh, and a uh, very, very fragile environment down into the U.S. And this was at a time when North America had 8% of the, of the world's population and was consuming 50% of oil and gas. Can you, can you imagine that? And we were being told that we needed this uh, pipeline. And uh, um, so... We, we discussed it at the, the CGL board and we said, well, let's, let's try and, and develop uh, an energy policy that uh, takes into account uh, some of these uh, considerations. So alternative energy, uh, lowering consumption, and then uh, the decision-making uh, process, which was very important because 
At that time, the National Energy Board was a, a rubber stamp. Any project that was proposed got approved. And uh, government didn't really wait until the, you know, you had uh, hearings to consider these things. Government, you, you know, and they were uh, in bed with, with industry. So we, we said uh, uh, this in this energy policy, we need to have a new approach with this new decision making that takes uh, indigenous rights and the environment into account in deciding whether or not to go ahead with the project and not just as afterthoughts to be considered to, to, to minimize the damage. And that remains today one of the most fundamental issues in this country. We need a decision-making uh, uh, bodies and government to take indigenous rights and the environment into account in making decisions, not to minimize damage once those decisions are made. So we uh, we talked to the the Dene uh, in the uh, uh, Northwest Territories and said, look, and that was my my first. They they said, look, you know, we uh, we know who we are. We've been self determining for thousands of years. If you want to help us, your job is to dismantle the oppressive uh, uh, colonial institutions that make it so hard for us to live our lives. And that was a, a, a that became my mantra in 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 the work I do. It's our job, non-indigenous people, to dismantle all those colonial institutions that make it so difficult for indigenous people. Uh, to live and be uh, self-determining. So we um, uh, we decided to intervene before the uh, National Energy Board. And uh, for the first time, uh, we brought church leaders uh, to testify before the National Energy Board. I'll never forget uh, Primate Ted Scott coming in in his robes and the powerful message these church leaders uh, gave about the need uh, to to protect the uh, creation, we also brought uh, people like um, Mel Watkins, uh, Abe Rothstein, Mayor Brownstone, who all saw that there was a, a real need to uh, to confront uh, this 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 system that was was threatening the earth and indigenous uh, people. Um, we also and. This is not really known very well, but CPJ was the first organization that proposed a moratorium on the pipeline. And we discussed that with the Dene and said, look, let's not say no pipeline. Let's say a moratorium of 10 years to start a discussion about these crucial issues. Uh, it proved to be, uh, I think, a good thing to do. There was a lot of pushback from, uh, as you can imagine, most of the uh, executives in these oil companies uh, sat in the, the churches, Anglican, Catholic, United Churches across the country. They were not happy about the call for a moratorium that Project North uh, Church Coalition joined in. And uh, so uh, eventually 183 groups endorsed the call for a moratorium. Berger uh, uh, said, yes, we need a moratorium. And Trudeau, uh, Pierre Trudeau said yes. And uh, there was that moratorium to give the Dene time to work on their claims. And uh, we kept the discussion going around uh, this, uh, this approach for uh, an energy uh, policy. Uh, that pipeline was, was never built. It's often been described as a David and Goliath uh, uh, kind of event, which it was. Here we were a ragtag group of people with indigenous folks and environmentalists who stopped the seven sisters in, in their tracks on this, this, this pipeline. So um, it goes to show you that uh, particularly collaboration on these important issues is, uh, is fundamental. I have gone way over my three minutes, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Yeah.
even when I was um, serving as a staff member at CPJ, I remember um, just learning so much about the historical work um, on the moratorium of the pipeline and how that really informed the way we built relationships with Indigenous communities and um, did our policy research. So yeah, thank you so much for all your contributions. Um, so Ali, um, why do you think it is imperative um, to emphasize the intergenerational link in advancing climate justice, um, especially in light of your impressive work in mobilizing youth? And how does engaging multiple different generations contribute to the effectiveness of climate justice? Sure. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's really lovely to, to meet a lot of you for the first time. Um, often in the work I do, I feel like I always run into the same like 10 to 15 people. And sometimes I worry, like, are we the only 10 to 15 people that care? And then I meet a whole new crowd and it makes me really happy. So thank you for providing me with that experience. Um, I'm glad you asked about intergenerational work and not just about youth work, because we've seen a weird like 180 where for decades, you know, youth were really just at the kids table. And then a lot of progressive or well-meaning spaces, all of the sudden, it went completely to the opposite to let's only have youth. Let's just have youth do everything. Let's just, it's just youth, youth, youth. And don't get me wrong, like youth are really important. First of all, when it comes to the climate crisis, um, they're stakeholders, it's our entire lives that are at stake. Um, and also we have a lot of assets, you know, anything from, from the creativity, um, this, this optimism, this energy, this ability to think uh, beyond what we know, but there's a risk to like shift the burden completely if we just give it all to the youth, um, which is helpful for no one. And then there's also just like a strategic mistake to think that youth have all the tools we need to tackle something as major as the climate crisis or, you know, as, as deeply rooted as, as uh, uh, colonialism and in settler colonialism. Um, so to me, the importance of, uh, of intergenerational organizing became very clear actually when I started organizing in, in Toronto. I was new, I came here from south of France um, and I, I didn't know much. And the first group that I joined, like the first meeting I joined was a group of moms and grandmas who are doing work around climate. And there's the one who told me, if you start a youth group, we'll support you with everything. Like we'll teach you how to do an application for a protest permit. We know how to rent the equipment for like a stage and things like that. And so I saw firsthand the importance of knowledge translation, like um, transfer, skills transfer, networks. They also introduced me to people who could give us meta funding. Um, and so that's the first kind of key element. It would be a mistake to lose that by thinking we can organize in silos. Um, there's, not, there's another one that I love um, talking about. It's that it's we need a diversity of, of tactics, of methods to get the justice we want. And um, youth are really good at some sort of, of organizing, right? Maybe it's high energy, high impact, very visual. But there's work, for example, in the climate space done by um, seniors for climate action, for example, or climate fast. That's by nature, sometimes way more accessible because um, they've taken into account some, some you know, constraints that we haven't. Or sometimes it speaks to a different audience um, or sometimes it'll have more sway with certain communities just because of, again, the nature of the people there. And so if we just had the youth-led actions, we would only speak to a tiny portion of the population and often not the ones making the decision. So there's that importance of the of, you know, diversity of tactics. Um, and the last thing I'll say on, on where I've seen the value is um, on, on the resilience. Um, I've seen it because I was organizing when I was in high school and then in university. I'm really into organizing. I'm really motivated. And then exam season hits and I'm like, you know, later, like, and so it was really good to be able to rely on people, especially folks that were retired and that were able to say, we'll manage it while you're going to your, to your exams and, and come back in a month and we'll still be there and, and things will have collapsed completely. So resilience also, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, I'm just going to say Ali's work around organizing um, the youth movements. They're incredible. They're so instrumental in advancing climate justice among youth. Um, the kind of coalition group that she created, Fridays for Future, I was a part of one of their um, demonstrations. And it's just, it's such an amazing platform. And the amount of um, 
voice that they can gather um, is just truly inspiring. So thank you so much, Ali. Um, so back to you, John. Um, this is more of a question um, around how um, we can leverage our faith-based uh, perspectives. Um, so how can the pursuit of uh, indigenous recon reconciliation and climate justice uh, be intertwined to advance CPJ's vision um, as Christians in the pursuit of, um, of climate justice? Um, yeah, I think uh, um, one of the uh, uh, things we have to realize is the connection between climate justice and Indigenous rights. Um, indigenous people lived and respected the land for thousands of years before uh, the doctrine of discovery. And um, it was only, and, and incidentally, I mean, it was recently uh, renounced, but it was not rescinded. And that's a very, very important uh, difference. Uh, it must be rescinded because it, the renunciation, hopefully it will lead to something, but I think um, we we have to uh, understand that with, you know, Europeans came capitalism and the Christian church, this business of interpreting Genesis having dominion over the over the earth, really, uh, this, this you know this became sort of capitalism, and uh, very very unfortunate. It's still very much today with uh, with so many Christians that that means we have to subdue the earth, and uh, we've we've actually we're, we're wrecking the earth. And one of the ways of um, of uh, uh, addressing that, I think, is um, the the return of land to indigenous people. Uh, Eighty percent of land in Canada is called crown land. So we're not talking about taking land away from you know all of you who have titles to your houses. But that crown land was once all indigenous land. And one of the ways of moving towards uh, more caring for the earth is to return land to indigenous people, have them manage it based on their values, which are, 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 are quite different from the values of, of, of capitalist society. Uh, Canada has recently pledged to uh, set aside 30% of its um, uh, of our land and oceans uh, for for conservation, and said that Indigenous people should um, be very much involved in protection of that. I think one of the the um, the things that organizations like CPJ can do is to very carefully monitor that to make sure that. It, it actually happens because often when governments make these commitments, they're only on paper. So those those two things, monitoring that and then advocating for the return of a land to indigenous people so that they uh, can manage it in, in, in their own way. And indigenous people are not opposed to all development, but they are opposed to development that uh, only brings benefits to uh, to big companies and uh, they they suffer all the impacts. So I think those two things are, are extremely uh, important and uh, that organizations uh, should work together in collaboration around uh, uh, those those, those uh, two two issues. Uh, and there's a lot of strength uh, also in in uh, young people uh, leading leading uh, this and uh, expecting um, rightfully so that uh, those of us who are no longer uh, so young will 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 support them in that. Great, thanks so much, John. Um, in light of um, 
Actually, in the interest of time, I'm going to combine um, our last question with um, the second question, if that's all right. Um, so in the context of our theme of intergenerational advocacy um, and going deeper into um, your last point, um, how do you envision um, the involvement of uh, younger and future generations in upholding CPJ's mission? And what strategies or actions do you think can be implemented to ensure a smoother transition um, of climate justice advocacy um, so that we can empower and equip uh, the next generations to effectively um, carry the torch forward. And maybe you can refer to some of the climate um, justice uh, work that you've done in collaboration uh, with the CPJ. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a big question. So yeah, briefly on, on that point, because I think it'll help us understand the rest. Um, I've gotten to know CPJ and your work, mostly through working with Natalie, who's, who's here. Um, and I bring it up because even in the climate justice space where we, uh, we, you know, we are committed to those principles of, of justice, of reconciliation, sometimes we get really bogged down into um, getting emissions down, you know, lowering emissions because that's kind of our, our main focus and we're looking at the scientific reports and whatnot. And sometimes that makes us forget um, the bigger picture and, and sometimes the reason why we even got there in the first place. And we, we were organizing a summit on, on the topic of a just transition, a just energy transition for, for workers and communities. And um, Natalie was involved in, in the steering committee there and, and she pushed us to think about not the just transition um, only in terms of the people who are currently in a pretty good spot and want to transition in a way that they don't get into a bad spot, but she said, we're not just fighting for a just transition, we're fighting for a just society at the end of it. And so she kind of pushed us to think about those who were always excluded from economic opportunities, who don't have a good place to start and want to stay in a good place. They were just never there. And it seems obvious when I say it, but when you're really bogged down into like, who's the main obstacle to climate, you're mostly thinking of the people who already have a ton of privilege and don't want to lose it. And it's, and it, asks of you a special effort to take the time to also say, no, we're actually fighting for all of us. And that includes those who, um, because of the power they're not given, might not be an obstacle, but it doesn't matter. They, you, we still have that responsibility. So, so thanks for that. And that was my first introduction to the work of CPJ. And I think a good example of, of the values you carry generally. Um, and of course, in all the work you do, there's a climate tie. Um, there's the, you know, for the love of creation work that clearly is is so, you know, rooted in, in Earth around Earth Day and around participation in the UN climate spaces. Um, but I wanna point out that sometimes we forget that most work around justice is climate work and especially climate adaptation work because there's a sad reality. And I think if you have family or friends in, uh, in Alberta or, or in the Maritimes or, or around the world really, we know that there's some climate crisis that we can no longer avoid. There's some that we can still, and we still need to lead that fight, but there's some adaptation that needs to be done. Um, and anti-poverty work, housing justice work, refugee rights work, that's climate adaptation work because, you know, the climate crisis is going to exacerbate all of those. So in those ways, I see the interconnections very clearly. So when it comes to bringing youth in all of this, first, we have to remember where young people are at right now. Um, we we're seeing, I'm seeing when I go to high school, like a very high level of anxiety, of course, right? They were born being told that everything was ruined, you know, financial crisis, housing affordability, and then climate. So there's that high level anxiety, but worse than that, there's a high level of distrust. They've lost trust in most institutions. They've lost trust, we've lost trust in most, you know, figures of authority. So there's a big, like there's a really difficult exercise we need to do of still believing that um, we can convince someone who's in a decision-making power to change things. So I think that's something we have to take into account is, is not go and, and, and assume that if you explain to them, let's go and advocate to the government for this, they're going to trust you that it's going to work because they, they've never been proven that anybody in government really cares. So, so based on that, I think how we adapt our, our campaigns, our ways of organizing to kind of make them feel like, um, like they, they're doing it this past despite this lack of trust, right? Um, and I, I think maybe just briefly, the, the other way around is when we do intergenerational organizing, we have to keep in mind that it doesn't mean we need to all become very close friends. I think sometimes we confuse like intergenerational organizing with we're all hanging out all the time. 
And there's a reality. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm 24. Even when I organize with 15 year olds, they don't want to hang out with me. And I don't really want to hang out with them. I mean, you know, they're in a different spot in their life. And so that's a 10 year difference. Imagine a 40 year difference. We don't always want to want to be buddies. And I think that's okay. So I think when we do intergenerational organizing, I always try to encourage, you know, um, adult allies when I was still, you know, not an adult and now just like different generations to think about offering help, but not imposing it, understanding that you can just go and say, this is what I can do for you. And then kind of leave it there and trust that the day young people will need it, they'll come to you because you've offered, you know, kind of what you can do. Um, so really keeping in mind that it's okay not to do everything side by side, but as long as you're open dialogue, offering support, coordinating, being there, um, responding to their needs, then that's also intergenerational organizing and that's moving us further ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, Ali. Um, I really hope this uh, panel is being recorded because <laughs> these are really practical tips I can take on as well. Um, so yeah, the same question over to you, John. Yeah, I think that uh, young people need uh, the older generation to actually uh, accept responsibility for um, what, what we've contributed to and not only to change our personal kind of habits, but to get involved politically, to try and change the uh, the discussion. And, uh, you know, harping back a bit on the McKenzie Valley thing, uh, the, de the decision to, to call for a moratorium rather than say, well, shut down everything, uh, I'm I'm wondering whether uh, that might be a, a good thing to do, to say, let's just take a deep breath and let's slow down, let's stop all these uh, projects for a while and have a national discussion around our priorities. And uh, because uh, climate change affects, um, it doesn't really affect too much me or you or most of the people in this room. It affects people who are already struggling and in poverty. And that's, uh, that, that's a, huge, uh, a huge responsibility I think that we have. I think the, um, I'm very disappointed that the churches have basically dropped out of, uh, to a large extent, dropped out of the discussion around uh, climate change. They're nibbling around the edges. I think organizations like CPJ and public interest organizations, justice organizations, need to challenge churches, labor unions, professional organizations to take a, a real stand on, um, on this national discussion that w we need to, uh, to head uh, a different direction. And if we do that, I think young people uh, will will renew their faith in in who we are as a society and uh, work very diligently uh, to uh, to make things better for all of us, but particularly for those who are uh, suffer uh, most, and not just Canada, but around the world, those who suffer most are are people who are already very very distressed. So. We need to do that, and the faith communities uh, should be central uh, in that in that discussion. Not the only ones, but they, they need to, if they're true to their faith, uh, uh, need to be a very uh, at the heart of that discussion. And I think, you know, CPJ has the kind of uh, reputation that it can challenge the churches and other organizations to really. Uh, um, get involved in this this national discussion that uh, we really need to have. Yeah, thank you so much, John. I think it's so um, awesome that there is such a big tie between both of your responses of really coming together to dismantle these systems of oppression and these structures that we have, you know, in place from from history and, and that still remain as legacies of these uh, colonialism and oppression and coming together to bring all those generations together. So thank you so much for all of your insightful, um, yeah, presentations.
Thank you very much. Uh, this is one of the areas that CPJ has been engaged in uh, for many, many years. And we want to acknowledge uh, all the good partnerships, uh, collaborations that we work with, uh, the National Church Partners with the Joint uh, for the Love of Creation campaign, and that includes Kairos Canada. I want to thank Climate Action Network Canada, partners with the Green Economy Network, partners with the Joint Ecological Ministry, and the Green Resilience Project. So these are all important collaborative partners that, uh, that CPG works with. The next panel we're going to be looking at is on poverty, and I'll invite the panelists to come forward. The moderator interviewer will be Natalie Appleyard, and she is the socioeconomic um, um, uh, policy analyst for CPJ. Our historic perspective will be given by Laurel Rothman, who brings more than 40 years of experience as a professional volunteer and advocate in the community services field. She has worked in the voluntary sector, municipal and provincial governments, and the union movement. Since retiring as National Coordinator of Campaign 2000 End Child Poverty in Canada in 2015, she has remained active on issues of child care, child poverty, and hunger. Laurel has been a frequent media spokesperson on issues of children's well-being and has published articles in professional journals and magazines. In 2013, she was honored to be named the inaugural recipient of the Canadian Mothercraft Society's Bill Bosworth Memorial Award, recognizing leadership, innovation, and unwavering commitment to children and families. And then for our current and future perspective, uh, Shalini uh, Kononur, I hope I have the name right, is the Executive Director and Senior Lawyer at the South Asian Legal Clinic of Ontario and has practiced law in Ontario's legal aid clinic system for over 22 years. Uh, Shalini provides direct legal supports to low-income uh, racialized clients in a number of areas of law and also works on larger scale advocacy for systems change. Shalini on behalf of Salco is a founding and steering committee member of the Color of Poverty, Color of Change, which is focused on dismantling the impacts of racism and discrimination on all life outcomes, income, housing, education, employment, immigration, immigration justice, et cetera, for racialized people in Canada. Through COPC, Shalini has appeared in front of all levels of government and internationally at the United Nations to advocate against the growing racialization of poverty. Shalini has also appeared on, at all levels of court up to the Supreme Court of Canada on text cases that challenge racial discrimination Islamophobia, and discrimination against people with either precarious or no immigration status. So please join me in welcoming this wonderful panel. Well, it's a pleasure to be up here with both of you, uh, who I have tremendous respect for and have always really appreciated your generosity of your time and expertise. So thanks for being with us. Uh, Laurel, we'll start with you. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the early days of Campaign 2000 and a little bit about what Campaign 2000 is and um, also Campaign 2000 and CPJ's partnership? Sure. Uh, looking at those pictures and, and some of you in the audience who I've had the opportunity to work with over the years uh, brought back uh, many memories. So just briefly, uh, Campaign 2000 at this point is quite a broad coalition of organizations uh, seeking to end child and family poverty in Canada and started as far back as 1992 with four kind of small groups who for a while talked among each other and actually did, did um, consultations across the country were able to do that around whether they could do something with that 1989 resolution one of the first unanimous resolutions of the House of Commons to seek to end child poverty in Canada. And they decided that they really had to shine 
the public focus, if you will, and media focus on that promise that happened on November 24th. Long story short, they decided they would do a citizen's report card of what the government did or did not do. So to this day, it's the annual report card is still done. It's become much bigger, more complex. There's one back there at the campaign 2000 table. But to try to zero in on the uh, what happened was that that those four small organizations at the time um, have expanded tremendously, and CPJ was a large part of that. I should say that um, we uh, CPJ and Campaign 2000 always shared a strong commitment to advocating for social justice and proposing doable solutions. I can just see Gerald Van de Zen saying, always stronger when you propose and not, not just oppose, Op oppose. So let me just give you one anecdote around, Harry may remember this or others in the room, I don't know. Now, it was slightly before my time. I came on in 1997, but in 1994, You'll remember, let's just take a little context. Uh, Chrétien had just been elected the liberals back in in 93 after almost a decade of the Mulroney conservatives, who at the time, what shall we say? Many people were not happy with. Um, in comparison now, I'm not sure what I think, but, um, or what many of us would. So, and there were rumors of big, big, cuts to social programs to deal with the deficit. And so three organizations, CPJ, uh, one of the founding partners of Campaign 2000, which was called the Child Poverty Action Group, and the Social Planning Council of Toronto said, we're going to go on record. We're going to make a statement that uh, cutting, cutting social spending is not the only way to deal with the deficit. There are other options. You could deal with tax reform, et cetera. And so they released a short report called Paying for Canada, um, uh, uh, looking at public financing and national programming. And they basically tried to turn around what at the time, you'll remember it was Margaret Thatcher time. And she said something like, uh, there is no alternative to cutting. And so um, that was one of the first um, collaborations, a very vibrant one included, uh, some of you might have remembered Marvin Novick. And at the time, Armin Yalnesian was at the Social Planning Council. We now hear her quite a bit as an economic commentator. And, um, and Gerald Van de Zand was raring to go and in good, healthy spirits at the time. Um, so that was the first collaboration. And as the, um, this was 94. And as the years kind of went on, Campaign 2000 got bigger and tried to collect more partners and networks. And remember, this was all pre-internet. I mean, having a conference call across the country was expensive at one point. It was hard to make those, harder to make those connections. I'll try to keep it short. But um, so we were building up to 1999. That was gonna be 10 years since the all party resolution and make a long story short, CPJ was tremendously uh, helpful and uh, active, active partner. At the time, the office was in Toronto. They were a national, you know, CPJ as a national organization. And Campaign 2000, working toward being a national network, was also based in Toronto. So we kind of hung out together. And I think the, the chemistry and there was a lot of mutual self-respect and good work. Um, and so we said, OK, the budget. 2000, federal budget 2000 needs to be a children's budget. So I actually saved, Renee may remember this and Harry, I saved one of the posters in the old days, you would have a designer make the poster and you'd figure out how you would get it out to the people across the country. So this is one of the few mementos we saved. Maybe the, the important thing was it was an attempt to do as much mobilization. We did have on November 24th, we had events in 100 uh, communities across Canada, whether it was Silence at Six, which I think was Greg DeGroote Majetti's idea, where we would do a candlelight vigil. Some did that. Some did clanging pans like uh, we've done in support of healthcare workers and other kinds of things. And we even had a rally on uh, uh, Parliament Hill and the ministers came out and there was a lot of noise, or at least it seemed like a fair amount of noise with a goal toward a uh, 
children's budget in 2000, which let's just say didn't quite pan out the way we hoped. Um, so I'll just maybe stop to say that we went on a campaign 2000 and CPJ went on to work very closely together on issues on lobbies of MPs and at, at the provincial level, particularly in Ontario, and very much CPJ was key in the multi-faith work. At one point, we had the dynamic trio of June Callwood, uh, the late uh, activist and author, Gerald Van de Zand, and Rabbi Arthur Bielfeld, who were sort of forming another little network within the network, and they helped raise money, and we did those full page ads in the Globe and Mail about child poverty for a number of years and 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 you know met together with public officials, et cetera. So um it's been, I think, a long and strong and deep and well respected partnership, which I gather is still going. So I'll stop there. And I'll just say what a privilege and uh what a tremendous asset it is to be part of the campaign 2000 steering committee. I always go and I'm just surrounded by so many wonderful, knowledgeable, <laughs> generous people. So the, it's a pleasure. Um, since that initial all party commitment to ending child poverty by the year 2000, which has not yet happened, um, what are some, uh, we know that there's still a long way to go, but what, what are some milestones that you would highlight? That some, I would highlight? Some positive. Um, well, let me just think. Well, it, it was important in 1999 that we did get some real attention. There was, Marvin used to say, you could struggle to get it on the agenda. Then to get action is a whole other series of issues. And I would say going from that, remember we then had uh, change in, we had many things. I'm oh, we did have a significant, 90, 1997 was the introduction of the child benefit. It was not a significant amount. It went up much more considerably, ironically. Um, uh, Harper created a, a, a transfer to families, which was not very equitable. Everybody, whether you earned 150,000 or 15,000 got the same amount of money. But when the liberals came in in, um, when was it, 2015, uh, that amount of money was both increased and uh, made progressive such that lower income families got more money and upper income families got less money. So about 90% of children in Canada receive some and their families receive some form of income uh, support. So that's one. Th and that's something that CPJ and we and the coalitions worked hard for to make that more uh, small p progressive, and the, I, no question that the introduction of the Poverty Reduction Act, okay, I'm embarrassed to tell you, was it 2018 or 2019? I think it was, whatever, 18, okay, sorry. That was that was a milestone. It's something we pushed for a lot. Um, I think many of us would want to keep pushing toward better implementation, but those were two key points. Thanks, Laurel. And Shalini, I think we connected through Campaign 2000 initially and your work with Color of Poverty, Color of Change and, and SELCO. Um, and I've been just so grateful for your research and advocacy related to this intersectional rights-based uh, approach to poverty er eradication. <clears throat> and certainly there's lots of overlap with our work on refugee and migrant rights as well. Uh, so can you share with us some of the key pieces that you've been advocating for and where you have found some success? Sure. First, I want to say congratulations to Citizens for Public Justice. That's incredible, 60 years. And thank you for putting me in the young person seat. I just left a 14 and a 12-year-old who think I'm literally the oldest person in the world. <laughs> so I, I, I hope that the, I can show them this recording of me in the young seat. <laughs> um, so... You know, in the work that we do at Color, Color of Poverty, Color of Change was started in Ontario because we started looking at census data and really seeing the disproportionate rates of poverty for Indigenous, Black, and racialized communities, not just in Ontario, but across the country. And so we started talking about something we call the racialization of poverty. And we'd often get pushback from people saying, well, that's just a newcomer issue, as if Indigenous people are newcomers to this land, right? 
and it's not. And we now have enough generational data to know that it's really the result of systemic racism and discrimination within multiple systems that keep people in these cycles of poverty. And so we started thinking about what we can do. And, um, you know, the things that we've started pushing for, we've had moderate success with. The first one was one that doesn't sound glamorous, but that was critical and continues to be for all of our work, which was data collection. And in my view, Canada is intentional about not collecting the data that we need because it will show us how much we're failing in terms of poverty reduction. In fact, I was telling Natalie today that I was at a meeting with the government last week around the UN Committee on the Rights of Children, where they were touting the incredible job they've done in the reduction of poverty for children in Canada. That same day, I worked with a client in the morning who's living with her three kids in a car. So there's a real disconnect between what our government seems to believe is happening and the data that we know to be true on the ground for people in this country. And so data collection is one of the key pieces. The other piece that we are really pushing for is in the conversation around poverty reduction, and this doesn't happen in activist circles, it happens at these decision-making tables, the focus is always on certain populations, permanent residents, citizens. We are not talking about the growing population of people with no status and precarious status in this country that are made that way intentionally by our immigration systems. And we are not talking about the fact that most of those people right now are racialized and that they live at a level of poverty that, you know, I've been working in the clinic system for 23 years. I actually haven't seen it this bad, the way that people are struggling. And so we need to build their capacity to be at those tables and we need to have those voices expressed. For many, many years, we've been working to make the child benefit accessible to people who don't have the prerequisite immigration status. We have kids in this country who are citizens because their mothers and fathers don't have status, they don't get the Canada child benefit and they're struggling. And you know, when I sit at these tables, I talk about being with clients who are making decisions around who's going to eat breakfast, who's going to eat lunch, who's going to eat dinner, where are they going to live in 2023 in a country that is abundantly wealthy, right? So that's the other piece. And finally, the last thing that's been critical for us is the conversation around employment equity. At the root of a lot of this, you can have income supports, but what my clients always talk to me about is wanting to work having good jobs, getting a job, retaining a job, being paid a good wage, having employment standards for a ceiling where they're not treated horrifically. I'm working with 30 people right now in the city of Toronto who are non-status and they're being paid $3 an hour. That's happening here, right? And we're letting that happen. So that employment piece, the racialization of poverty and the data collection are the three things I think that are really at the core of the work that we're doing right now. Thanks so much, Shalini, and thanks for uh, sharing those, you know, real life day to day examples of what this looks like on the ground, because certainly um, we can cherry pick data and certainly both in terms of which data is collected, but also how we report it, how we measure it. Uh, and this is these are themes that continue to come up in, in your work. I know when Campaign 2000's uh, report card and in, um, in CPJ's own poverty trends report. So thanks for um giving some some skin to that <laughs> um so you, you've spoken to some of the kind of um the the framing of some of these issues some of the perspectives that you'd like to see in terms of just um i think maybe naming more explicitly what we're actually dealing with um are there some some best practices or uh, or approaches that, uh, and maybe I'll invite both of you to speak to this, that you would like to see uh, adopted in terms of our ongoing uh, collaborative poverty work? I'll start by saying maybe as a reflection of what I and many I worked with over the years, I should, I just have to say to, um, to you that at the beginning of the discussion of race-based data, I have to say I'm of a different generation and 
coming from a, a Jewish background, the notion of race-based data just brought up the Nazis to me. And so it was an important discussion over a period of time to better understand. And of course, our data got better too. It's not wonderful, but it got better way back from the late 90s. Um, so pre appreciate all the work that, that that's been done. Um, I mean, the other thing I'm looking at Renee, a person with whom I've worked uh, a lot uh, over the years, I, I think a better and ongoing, uh, uh, what's the right word? Collaboration and maybe allyship is a better word of working with people with lived experience of poverty, whether now or in the past, or, you know, it, it, people can move in and out of poverty and ensuring that um, uh, the voice of experience um, is heard clearly, along with the data often reflects the experience, not always, but certainly making sure that each reinforces the other. So I've, I've been thinking a lot about that too, Laurel, that capacity building that I sit in spaces, but it should be not me. It should be the people who are facing these very real problems. And I think decision makers should be hearing from those people. But then of course, there are a lot of barriers for why that doesn't happen, right? I think like what you're doing today is a best practice because the truth is a lot of the work that we've done is on the shoulders of the work that um, Citizens for Public Justice have done, the work that Campaign 2000 has done. And we've learned so much from it and the generosity of the information provided on what worked and what didn't work, the ideas around moratoriums versus opposition, all of those learnings are really critical for us to move forward, right? And, you know, I have kids, right? So I, I can see, and my mom also lives with us, like seeing my own house, the value of the different experiences of these generations and what all of that together brings to the table. So I think we should never forget that, right? In, in, in the work that we're doing, what didn't work, what worked, and who are the people that we maybe missed in the past that we need to start thinking about now, right? And so I think that's an incredible piece. Um, I think um, grassroots organizing is still really critical. I feel like because we had a COVID experience and we jumped into this virtual world, we're a little disconnected from each other. And I would love to see us go back to those types of connections where we're doing that grassroots organizing. Um, and I think every chance we get, we need to put in front of decision makers the reality. They need to be able to come back and tell us that I'm cool with that, that your client is only going to get $700 a month to live in Toronto, pay rent, eat, and all of that. And so, you know, pushing the reality of it and really using all the new tools that I'm still trying to figure out, like all the social media tools, um, is a good thing. We've had a lot of great success in getting message out using all of those things. That was a perfect segue into our final question, which is, again, just given our theme of intergenerational advocacy this evening, what are the, the movements or who are the people that have really shaped your advocacy? Um, and you can think about this both, you know, as personally and professionally as you want. I, I always think about how um, one of the greatest gifts that I've learned recently is um, about kind of mitigating the risk of burnout and mitigating the risk of uh, cynicism, maybe by uh, seeing our place in that great history, that great legacy, that those generations of of advocates. So who are who are some of the either individuals or movements that have shaped your advocacy? And what is the legacy that you hope to contribute to? That, that'll be your final question. You can start small and go back and forth if you want to. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that one, except I guess, how, how does one get influenced? By the wide range of people you work with, whether it's learning more about, well, certainly for me, I'm a, believe it or not, I'm an immigrant from the U.S., so that's not quite the experience at all that many other immigrants have, but it's a good learning, pick, learning good indigenous, choice. Pardon? good choice, a good choice, <laughs> right, and I'm glad I stayed, yeah, um, learning about indigenous 
uh, history and, and Canada's uh, uh, record, shall we say, was new to me and a very, uh, well, new over the last 20 years and, and um, important in shaping um, thinking and work that we do, getting to know people who more directly and working with people who've experienced poverty in various capacities, uh, people with disabilities, all kinds of people. And um, I guess always being willing to listen at some point doesn't mean you have to agree and then figuring out how to respond. I mean, those have been some of the ways you try to survive. So I was thinking about uh, this question. There's a lot of people in this room who I, who I deeply, deeply admire. Um, and another piece that we're working on is um, getting the knowledge out about some of the really historical and incredible racialized people who have shaped this country as well. Um, my own kids don't know a lot about the South Asian activism in Canada that has happened since the 1800s. Right. And so there are a lot of trailblazers out there. There are more recent ones, like for me, the Uzma Shakirs of the world and the Debbie Douglases, people who I'm here because of the work that they've done. Um, and one of the, the things that I think inspires me the most, to be honest, is just seeing the brilliance of the clients I work with. You know, like I'm talking about things that seem deeply sad but they live lives of deep joy and resilience and they're brilliant in the way they navigate spaces, communities, this society, everything. And I'm in awe. I'm in awe of what they do. And anytime I feel like complaining, I see a client, I think, how are you doing, how do you, how are you doing this? And how are you doing this? And how are you bringing me food and asking if I'm okay? Right. Um, and so that sticks with me a lot. And my daughter said to me the other day, I was going out to speak somewhere and I was talking to my partner about, I don't know like if any of this is working, you know, we kind of get down sometimes, right? And she said, mom, all you need to do is leave it a little better than when you started. And um, I think that encapsulates it for me perfectly that I don't have this lofty goal. If I can just leave it a little better than when I started, I feel like that's a good legacy. And if I can raise two activists, that would be awesome too. <laughs> Thank you both so much for your, your insights and for everything you shared with us. That is correct. So in order for you to qualify for the Canada Child Benefit, the parent who's applying has to have a certain level of immigration status. So if my kids are born here, but I have no immigration status, they don't get it. I can do you one better. If you go to the website of the Chinese and Southeast Asian Legal Clinic, they have a tab called our Canada Child Benefit Campaign, which has pre sort of um, materials that you can click on and send letters and messages to your members of parliament. Perfect, and we'll share that. But thank you for giving me the chance to plug it. <laughs> All right, thank you. And maybe we have a number of partners who want to acknowledge and as a way of having a bit of a stretch, no talking to each other, but stand as a way of helping acknowledge uh, these partners in this area, uh, Canada Without Poverty, Sisters of Service and their support of Dignity for All, Public Service Alliance of Canada. They also had the Dignity for All support over 100 local organizers from previous two on this campaigns, members of the Canadian Council of Churches Commission on Justice and Peace, notably Peter Nodeboom and Jonathan Schmidt, uh, the Canadian Poverty Institute, Basic Income Canada Network and National Church Partners, National Right to Housing Network, and Leading in Color. So I'll 
long list of strong collaborators and strong partners. So, all right, please be seated. And our last um, panel, we'll invite them to come forward, is on refugee migrant rights. And that's going to be moderated by Emilio Rodriguez, who is our refugee and migrant rights policy analyst. The historic perspective will be brought to you by Peter Nodeboom, who serves as the General Secretary of the Canadian uh, Council of Churches since 2018 and the co-chair of the Canadian Interfaith Conversation. With a wealth of experience, Peter has supported committees on justice, human rights, and anti-racism. Peter's commitment to social uh, equity extends to the Interfaith Committee for the Canadian Military Chaplaincy and the Interfaith Committee of Chaplaincy in the Correctional Service of Canada. Ordained as a commissioned pastor, he serves his home church, the Christian Reformed Church in North America. His academic journey includes degrees in philosophy, European studies, and Christian political theory. Peter Notaboom's journey stands as an inspiration to all who aspire to create a more just and inclusive society. Through his steadfast leadership, unwavering commitment, and boundless passion, he has become a catalyst for positive change, reminding us of the transformative power that lies within each of us. And then for the um, uh, future current perspective, uh, Washma Ahmad Badzami, I'm sorry, uh, did I do not too, too bad? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, but uh, she is an advocate for refugee rights who has worked for organizations such as the Samuel Center for Social Connectedness and Human Rights Watch. She played a prominent role in the Welcome to Canada campaign, which seeks to eradicate immigration detentions in Canada. So please give a round of applause to this final panel. Thank you, Peter and Washma, for, for being here with me. Uh, these are two partners in our work, but also I am delighted to say to contributors to uh, CPJ's upcoming book, A Renewed Canadian Welcome. Uh, you're going to be privileged right now to hear a bit of, a, um, uh, I would say, a sneak peek into, into this book that uh, we're publishing with the McGill Queen's University Press next year, and that is trying to articulate uh, a renewed vision for how Canada should welcome uh, people into this country, uh, a vision that is rooted in human rights, uh, in public justice, and in upholding human dignity. Uh, so I'm really pleased to have you both here and to share some of these ideas. Peter, I'll start with you. Uh, I would love to hear more about your work in the refugee rights space, uh, particularly, and ways in which you have collaborated with CPJ over the years. Thank you so much, Emilio. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Really feels like the community of saints and saintly people and in a saintly building, a saintly community. There are many members of this church community, Holy Trinity, who have contributed a lot to the refugee rights work and maybe much more than I have. I'm not the same as John or Laurel, who have a really a deep long historic commitment to climate and indigenous rights or poverty, people who I really looked up to and have learned a lot from over the years. I'm really more of a, I've arrived to be a bit of a custodian of the ecumenical justice legacy, also in the area of refugee rights. So I don't have that depth of understanding around refugee rights. But let me tell you something about why the relationship with CPJ is special compared to say where I work, which is the Canadian Council of Churches. So at the council, you know, we might bring together 24 member churches. We might bring together a broad swath of the Christian community who want to work by consensus, but we're not agile. We can't respond immediately quickly to the question of the day. We might be able to draw on 80 years of history of engagement on a variety of justice issues, but also refugee issues, but we can't turn that 
80 years of history and legacy that we're privileged to carry forward into educational materials in a way that CPJ can. And so it's really being part of, a, of an ecosystem is what I'd like to say. We're part of a broader community and it's wonderful the way you're naming the partnerships of all these different areas of work, that those partnerships or that ecosystem of organizations committed in the same way to work for refugee rights. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. We really appreciate that partnership. And something that we want to highlight is we all have our strengths and CPJ would be nothing without this partnership. So the reason why we mention that is because we couldn't do any of our work uh, without partners like uh, the CCC. Um, Mashma, I would like to ask you more about your work in the refugee rights space specifically and ways in which you have also collaborated with CPJ in recent years. Thank you, Emilio, and thank you, CPJ, and for Peter for allowing me to share the stage with you guys. Um, I think a lot of the work that I've done on advocacy and in terms of immigration and refugee rights has been with Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International's Welcome to Canada campaign, which is seeking to raise awareness about immigration detention in Canada. And by doing so, we are calling on Canadian citizens to call upon their government leaders um, to help end the contracts between the federal and provincial governments, which allow them to detain immigrants and refugees in provincial jail facilities. And one of the events that we've done with CPJ was a, well, an interfaith call to action. And that event, I truly think was inspiring for myself personally. And we've done many more um, campaigns throughout Canada. And they've deemed very successful, I would say, with five provinces already agreeing to end the contracts. So I would say that's most of where my advocacy work does come from. Thank you very much, Fagma. And to follow up on that question for you, um, as you know, CPJ has an equity and anti-oppression statement uh, that informs the way that we work. Uh, could you share more about how uh, immigration policies, and in this case, unjust immigration policies, disproportionately impact specific groups of people, uh, and how you believe that work in the refugee rights space needs to take these people into account. Excuse me. Absolutely. I think in the immigration and refugee sector, we do see a lot of um, discrepancies between the way people are treated, whether it's based on their race, religion, or gender um, within the immigration field and particularly immigration detention. We find that individuals with psychosocial disabilities or mental health conditions are highly discriminated against in the detention facilities. And what we see is that we also see that immigrants who are from certain um, countries who are racialized, they also experience a lot of discrimination. And a lot of this comes with the fact that CBSA, those in charge of the immigration detention process, there's not a lot of oversight into how they can determine whether someone is being held into detention for long, pe long periods of time, or if they're deemed a high risk. So what we see is that there needs to be a change where we're eliminating these individuals who are responsible for these vulnerable groups and replacing them with people who have better knowledge and skills to cater to them. And just an example of how this can be shifted to, in a negative way is an example in the joint report by Human Rights, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International is that there was an individual who was detained in immigration detention for 11 years. And this was due to his apparent mental health conditions and due to the fact that the officers detaining the individual did not give him the proper support and they didn't really understand the circumstances for which that individual was acting about within the facility. So giving this discretion to these officers can create a lot of discrepancies and a lot of injustice within the detention facilities that we have in Canada. Thank you, Washma. Thank you for the expertise that you share with us as well. Um, I want to highlight that uh, this is an ongoing theme that we have seen in this panel. Shalini was already talking about how uh, some of the disproportionate impacts are particularly uh, harmful for racialized communities. Uh, and I, in this 60th anniversary, I just want to say that our, our equity and anti-oppression commitment is both a show, it's a demonstration of where we stand, but it's also a measure of accountability. So we really want to stand with 
uh, with these principles that we have highlighted here and that we invite you all as our members to, to keep us accountable in, in, in highlighting substantive work to address some of the systemic uh, discrimination. Peter, your work has been really prominent around uh, guaranteeing access to asylum. And by your work, I also mean the work of faith-based communities in Canada. Uh, can you speak more about why is it important that faith-based communities continue to push against policies like the U.S.-Canada uh, Safe Their Country Agreement uh, that restrict ac access to asylum in this country? Thank you so much. I think it's a, it's a long story. And, you know, thank you for sharing me with me the question earlier today. So I did just a little bit of review. Um, I found this book, Coalitions for Justice, has a chapter on refugees written by Henriette Thompson, who earlier was on the Zoom with, uh, with um, the AGM. And it really gives all the detail about uh, how the refugee rights work developed over the years. But it ends around 1990, and it continued then with work around the Safe Third Country Agreement. But I think it might be useful as part of that theme that I mentioned of ecosystem, of how we're all connected, working in partnership, also around this work in interfaith settings and in the Christian community, civil society too, how this work developed a little bit, the arc of it, as I understand it, uh, through the council and with the council. And the first chapter is really after Second World War, uh, when people were coming from refugee camps in Europe and the Middle East. Um, the World Council of Churches connected with the Canadian Council of Churches and said, couldn't you help to resettle and support the movement of refugees fleeing from the war or in refugee camps in Europe or in the Middle East to come to Canada? Couldn't you set up a revolving travel fund to help support the travel expenses of people who are traveling from Europe or the Middle East or other countries and coming to Canada. I have in our archives thousands of files of families and individuals who came to Canada through those uh, revolving funds. It's amazing to see all these index cards with pictures and their stories. It's quite striking. So that's really the first chapter. The second chapter, as I, as I understand it, maybe opens around the 1970s, 1980s, when other international events sparked migrations to Canada. The first one that comes up pretty strongly is Pinochet in Chile in 1974 or the early 1970s. Then, of course, the Vietnam situation and so many people coming here from Vietnam. Other countries, too, but that sparked the sponsorship agreement thing, right? Fine to welcome people here, but the government doesn't really have capacity to help settle them. Could churches, could faith communities, could other bodies extend the capacity of Canada to, to, to welcome, accept, provide hospitality uh, to refugees, refugees coming to Canada and asylum seekers? That's of course uh, an innovative thing that now many countries in the world have picked up but that was part of the work of the Canadian Council of Churches, but mainly the member churches of the council who picked that up and other faith communities and made that real. So that experience first of travel funds, then sponsorship agreements led people to say, well, actually there are some broader legal and human rights issues at play here, some procedural rights issues. And so, there was a long court challenge program of judicial activism that happened through the 1990s, through the early aughts, um, in the 1980s too. It's all in this chapter. There are so many different pieces of it, but the one that was critical for the Safe Third Country Agreement was the participation in the Singh decision, which is still marked today as Refugee Rights Day, where one of the wins was that anyone who's on the territory of Canada has access to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, including if you're in a port of entry or at some other entry point into Canada. And that was important uh, to guarantee then access to principles of justice and other aspects of the law that that, uh, that, that then made possible. 
And that's one of the cornerstones then of the Safe Third Country Agreement, that no matter what port of entry you come, come to, you should have access to those same principles of justice and the same principles of international law. And so that then is the, the final chapter. There have been a couple of runs on the Safe Third Country of Agreement. Um, Andrew Brower, who's a friend of, the, of CPJ, who has worked for CPJ, has led that refugee rights challenge, and it's been a real privilege to work with him and with, with uh, Can the Canadian Council for Refugees and with the Amnesty International Canada in that intervention. So a few different chapters in the story that I can highlight and the importance too of taking the long view, take the wide view, the ecosystem, all the partnerships that make it possible, but also to remember the history and to continue to build on it layer by layer. Thank you very much, Peter, for giving us that long view. Uh, and thank you also for mentioning Andrew Brower and others who were here and are present and are, are doing great work in this area. And that I'm happy to say that we're also featuring in the book uh, that's coming up next year. So uh, more and more reasons to read it, more and more reasons to follow it. Um, I just want to end with uh, this a similar question that we've asked to other panelists, uh, which is, your perspective on intergenerational advocacy and how we should move forward. And in this case, I want to ask to each of you in an area that I believe you have a lot of wisdom to, to give us. Uh, Peter, my question to you is, how do you envision intergenerational advocacy specifically around the refugee rights space and specifically coming from faith-based communities? What are some of the principles that you think should accompany advocacy in the years to come? And then I'll pass it to Washma and I'll ask you about intergenerational advocacy in refugee rights more generally from the perspective that you were sharing about centering the, 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 the principles of equity and anti-oppression in this work. So keeping in mind those principles of partnership, the council, for example, relies on CPJ and other organizations to engage other generations in the work. Um, so, so, so I don't have specific things to name there, but in terms of principles, I think there are some enduring ones that have been fairly valid for many generations. I'm thinking about, you know, there are three that come up again and again in the ecumenical justice work around refugee rights. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my sister's keeper? That original story, that traditional teaching, uh, the answer is yes, we are our brothers and our sisters keeper. Uh, that's one story that to me is what, what would we say today, evergreen? It's still always true. We're in this with each other. We have, uh, do I want to say, do we have our, each other's backs? We're in the same boat together. Maybe those are kind of worn out <laughs> pandemic phrases, but uh, the idea that we are our one another's keeper, I think is is uh, is an enduring one that has been around for many generations and I expect will be for many more. The other story in the Christian tradition that Jesus was a, ref was a refugee is another one of those stories that we'll be telling and retelling many times over again, a deep identification, also at a religious, spiritual, symbolic level with being a refugee, with being a sojourner, with not necessarily being at home in one place, with being on the way. And the third one uh, from Matthew 25, which is you know, how, will you, how, will, how will we know, right, that we've been on a good path, is that, you know, we will have welcomed the stranger. It's, again, one of those forever phrases, forever obligations, commitments, uh, faith traditions that will always be true and will always be uh, applicable to each generation. Thank you. Um, for me personally, I feel like advocacy is something I'm starting to relearn. We're looking at advocacy that's effective and is central to the individuals whose stories we're trying to share and trying to raise awareness on. And I feel like the ways in which I've engaged in advocacy is through various networks. What I've noticed is that what's most important is that we reach the message the most amount of people. So for me, it's understanding that 
a social media post will reach a certain type of audience, whereas a blog post could reach a different type of audience, whereas statistics and reports can reach a different type of audience. So it's not necessarily which type of resource or outlet we're looking for, but it's more so just making sure that it's there. And we can engage in advocacy in just everyday things that we do, just basic conversations with your neighbor on the issue that you've just learned about or taking it to class, taking it to your friends and your families. And what I've noticed in the immigration and refugee sector, it's not necessarily that people don't care. It's rather that they're not aware. They don't know. And I don't blame them. When we look around on the news and we see immigration and refugee in Canada, we see we see a different image versus what you know, immigration detention and those experiencing detention go through. It's a very different image. So I feel like the issue here is that we need to make sure that the, the, this message, that this issue is brought to the most amount of people because when I've had discussions with individuals and they hear about immigration detention, they're left in shock because they don't know about it and they're embarrassed. As Canadians, we should be embarrassed and the ways that we treat different types of people, whether it is indigenous communities, refugees, migrants, racialized communities, it's not so happy as the media shows it to be. So I feel like raising awareness, whether any way you can, and to the largest audience you can, is just the best way, I think, to engage in effective advocacy, in my opinion. Thank you both. I take the principles of uh, keeping each other's back and facing the reality and the real issues in this country as, as two of the of the really big pieces of wisdom that you that you leave with us. So thank you very much. I ask everyone to join me in a warm welcome to the Peter and Robin. Well, thank you. And our partners to acknowledge in this area will be the Christian Reform Center for Public Dialogue, World Renew, Human Rights Watch, IGM Canada, FCG Refugee uh, Center, uh, Action Refugee Muriel. <laughs> the only thing I can sound French is Muriel probably. So, uh, so thank you to these partners. So thank you very much. Well, this brings us to the end of the evening. Thank you all for being with us this evening. And uh, I trust that um, that um, the hope we had for this evening is or has been realized that you have been inspired by the achievements of the past. You've been energized by the challenges of the present, but most importantly, motivated by the possibilities of the future. That's uh, I hope that's been your experience tonight. Uh, of course, we want to make sure that um, uh, we encourage you in this 60th anniversary to become a member of CPJ if you're not, because as a lobby advocacy organization, it's critical that we're able to tell our, our elected officials that we are representing more and more Canadians that are aligning themselves with these concerns. And earlier uh, in a mailing this spring, we announced that we had, uh, through generous donors, $20,000 as a matching grant available in celebration of our 60th anniversary. I am so delighted to be able to tell you that that has inspired um, more donors. So tonight I can announce we have $60,000 as a matching grant from donors and so we're encouraging all members, uh, supporters across Canada of CPJ to give extra in celebration of our 60th anniversary and see if we can match uh, the generosity of donors and have an extra 60,000 plus 60, an extra $120,000 this year in, in celebration of 60 years. For those online, you can go to um, cpj.ca and make a special donation for those that are here. Um, see Michael, he'll be happy to, uh, <laughs> to take your, your donation. You've also heard quite a bit tonight about uh, our equity and anti-oppression commitment. And so as our most recent, in our most recent strategic plan, we want to continually build and diversify our membership and partnerships as part of that commitment. So this requires understanding both what we've been doing 
well to engage current members and identifying any barriers that might keep people from engaging with CPJ. So to help us in this task, in the next coming months, we will be launching a survey to get to know our existing members and partnerships. So that'll be coming in your, in your inbox. And we'll be inviting you to share a bit about who you are and through demographic information, as well as asking for your feedback on how and why you engage with CPJ. We'll also invite feedback on areas for improvement and look at any gaps that emerge through survey responses. So please look for that uh, coming into your, in your inbox and please do respond promptly so we can start to, to gather that information. Well, thank you again. This has been a wonderful evening. Thank you to all the panel participants and a very engaging crowd. Um, uh, I really appreciate your presence. So let me just, uh, let's end our time with, um, with this gratitude, a prayer of gratitude. Creator, receive our recollection of the past as gratitude of you for your faithfulness and strength through 60 years. Receive our naming of the current context of acknowledgement now of your faithful presence. And hear our peering into the future as our commitment to express our worship of you by loving all that you have created. Dismiss us now with hope, disturb us with vision, and empower us with courage. Amen. Thank you.